Welcome to Explosive Strength Podcast with Jared Bidney. On this episode, I'm just going to go over some more weekly shit, stuff that happens here at the gym, and I'm going to answer some questions that I received through email and Instagram. So anyway, here we go with another episode of Explosive Strength. So the other day I was in the gym and I rolled up the door. I've got a roll-up door that separates the, the 24 side and the Explosive Mechanics side. I got to go over there clean, check on things, from time to time just to make sure that everything's okay. And I saw a guy squatting over there and he was squatting outside the rack and he had like 295 pounds on the bar and I, I just shook my head and I said, damn, why in the hell would people squat outside of the rack? He was over there by himself, no one else around. And so I came back to Explosive Mechanics and uh, I was inside and I grabbed people and said, look at this guy. and. Uh, I said, who the hell does that? And so Jared, he may not know any better. And I'm thinking, you can't be that retarded, you know? Um, so I'm just kind of like, geez. And, and I, you gonna let him, you gonna say anything to him? I said, no. And the one I said, one of the people said, Jared, only you can prevent forest fires. And I said, damn, he should learn his lesson, you know? So I was just, I'm just kind of hard headed stuff out there. I just can't believe. And so I sat there and then, Jared, only you can prevent forest fire. So I said, geez. So Jared, he may not know again. <sighs> okay, whatever. So you're telling me I should go talk to the kid. I said, yes. All right, so I'll walk over there. And you know, like when, if you're training and you're working out, you don't want some jackass coming up to you, giving you advice or whatever. So I, I kind of go over there and handle the situation like, um, Hey, how are you doing? Because I don't know those people like I know the people here. Everybody that comes in explosive mechanics, I know them. I they, and they just can't come in. It's not a it's not an open gym. It's not like a twenty four hour side over here. If I am not here, explosive mechanics is shut down. I am pretty much the sole operator of everything over here. So if I'm not here, I shut the gym down. Um, and so all the people that come in here and train, I train them. I know what every person does. I know what I want them to do, and I know what I expect out of them. Um, and so they have to come. I don't. They come at different times, at different training schedules, for them. And I'll probably get to some of that and some of the questions that I received. So I know everybody over here. And sometimes these people come and sign up for twenty four. When they come sign up, I still got to sign them up for the twenty four side. Uh, but I don't have any daily interaction with them. And once I sign them up. I may never even talk to them again until I get an email, hey, I'd like to cancel my membership or something like that. So I sat there and said, um, hey, how's it going? Um, excuse me, why do you why do you squat outside the uh, squat rack? And the kid goes, well, I don't like being confined. And it is fairly young kid. I don't think he's been out of high school uh, too long if he's not at maybe a senior or something like that. And I said, you're over here by yourself kind of look around yeah I said what would happen if you squat down and you pull or pop a hamstring I said you're gonna go straight down immediately that bar is gonna be on your back you can get seriously hurt uh, you don't have any safety pins you don't have any safety catches you don't have anything to save you I said what if I said I give you an example back in March I was squatting I went down to squat and it sounded like someone tearing beef jerky I ripped my adductor and I, I said, but when I squat, even if I'm on the mono lift, I use those uh, yellow safety straps by Spud Inc. And so even if I squat in a rack, I still have my safety pin set up to a height to where something, if something were to happen, I can get out. And um, in explosive mechanics, we don't really spot everybody. So when we squat, sometimes we do have spotters, but we have the safety pins up high enough to where if they dump the bar, they can get out through there. Um, and, and I hate I hate seeing that BS on Instagram or uh, Facebook or, or even YouTube where the strength coach is behind the guy squatting. No, put their asses in a rack. If they can't get it, let them get it off the, let it get on the safety pins. You know, let, let, let the rack catch them. I hate seeing people behind people's chest that they squat it. They didn't squat that. You can't do that in a USAPL power of competition, SPF or any of that stuff. And so I was just trying to, trying to tell the kid he needed to squat in a squat rack without Tell him to squat a squat rack next time I see you. So, um, and so I said, when I was, and I said, I was squat when I stayed squat bar. So when I went down, my I tore my adductor on the way down. I said, if I did not have those yellow safety straps there, 
that safety squat bar could have freaking pinned my head down to where I couldn't have got out. And I went straight down. There's no getting out of it. I couldn't dump the bar. And so what I'm trying to tell the kid is, if you go down and you pop a hamstring or you do something like I did and you tear your adductor, um, you're gonna go straight down and that 295 pounds is gonna be straight on top of you. There's no dumping a bar if, um, if something tears or pops or does something on the way down. Now, if you sit down and strain and can't get up with it, you, yeah, you can dump it. But if something pops, pulls, or tears, you're done. And so um, I just had to prevent a forest fire, put that in that kid's head. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you listen or not. I don't, I don't check on that place on, the, on a daily basis. I don't know. He has come back several times, wave at me, but I have not seen him squat since. So I don't know what's happening with that to give you an update. So anyway, so that was a day. And this uh, kid, said, he finally listened to one of my podcasts. And it's crazy. The, he said, listening to me talk on the podcast is different than listening to me talk in the gym. He gets more of what I'm saying because there's no interruptions. Like when you're when I'm here at the gym, I have got my brain is going all over the place, and sometimes I don't even get a complete sentence out. So, hey, Jack, hey, what's going on? Hey, and I'm off to the next spot. Um, I'm trying to watch everybody, although sometimes I can't perfectly see everything. That's why everybody that trains here has their own individual folder. They come in at the top of an hour, and we all start together, but after we finish our main things, we may branch off into several different areas and do different things based off what people need to do in order to get better. It's not like a, a CrossFit place or something like that. Like it's not like I used to work at uh, Velocity when I was in college. You, it's not an organized, hey, I'm gonna follow this check mark, this check mark, so everybody in the entire thing is gonna be, all right, group, we're gonna go through this. It's not group training, although we are here in groups, but everybody, well, this kid may need to work on his hamstrings. Oh, this, this girl's got weak ankles. Let's go do some stuff like that for her. Um, so after our main lifts, which we do bench and squat all the time, we are very high frequently benching and squatting. And so after our main lift, we'll branch off and do um, other things. But he said, listening to you talk on a podcast makes more sense because there's, there's no distractions. And he said, and I actually have a chance to sit there and listen to it. And what he likes is, uh, he, can you just talk about like mental resistance? Uh, the mind telling you stop when you can keep going. Um, I said, yeah, I said, yeah, that starts with training partners, you know? If you, I told him, I said, if, if you don't come squat, I may, I may skip my squats that day. I said, cause that one Sunday, me and him were squatting, the gym closes at last hour on Sundays from two to three. We didn't start warming up to our, for our squat set until 3.15. So after everybody's leaving, and, I'm, and I got shit to do when I get home, so I'm, Sunday's the day I cook and try to get my food ready for the week so I don't have to sit there and do that when I get home late at night from the gym. Um, so I go home and cook all of our meats and my wife does all the other stuff uh, just to kind of get ready for the week. So at Sunday, I'm kind of ready mentally to check out and get the freak out of here. Uh, because we were supposed to squat at one, but for some reason that one day I had, I only have one safety squat bar and I'm ordering two more this week, but seven people showed up at the same time to squat on the same damn bar. And that's how I had them programmed. It's like, oh shit, we got a mess. So I'm gonna order another in case I don't have to deal with that issue if that occurs again. But I do have certain people doing box squats. I do have certain people doing safety bar box squat i got people safety bar regular squat without the box i got people doing front squats i got people squatting with a straight bar regular squat i got people squatting with a straight bar uh box squat so it, it can actually be all over the place but as long as we all squat together it don't matter what type of squat they do but depending on what that person needs is what they're going to do and um so ended up, we didn't able, we were not able to squat at that one o'clock time. Then two o'clock got busy because I probably had somebody new. So if someone new comes in for the past X number of years, my, my workout gets kicked off to the side uh, because I'm supposed to take care of the people that come here. Uh, and so something happened to where, okay, one o'clock, I'm only here two hours, I'm one to two and two to three on Sunday. And so I was wanting to squat at once. So, you know, if you're ready to squat and you want to do it, you want to do it right then. 
but I can't tell those kids no. You know, I had that program. Let's say squat. I, no, y'all go squat on the, on the uh, straight bar today. No, that ain't how it works. If I got you on this, this is what we're doing. We're not bouncing around. We're not. Ooh, let's do this today. Mm. Oh, that's good. Hey, let's try this. Hey, let's all do this today. No, we're going to stay right here and we're going to get a training result off of this and out of this. And then we'll move on to something else later on down the road. Um, but the people that I've had squatting with a safety squat bar off the box, safety bar box squat with speed bend marriage on the Tendo unit, their jumps are starting to improve a lot quicker than the people who have been just straight bar box squatting. And so anyway, I'll, I'll get into more of that later, but I want to finish the point of mental resistance. And so by the time we, we started warming up, it was three o'clock, I was already fried because I wanted to squat at one, now here it is 3.15. And I, don't, and I don't feel the greatest this day either. And so we started warming up, ah, oh, damn, my knees hurt. Um, uh, I just, this sucks, you know? And um, I said, I, I'll warm up, and so I warmed up. And my last warm up said I did, I said, I turned to him, I said, I'm not squatting today. He said, come on, we gotta do something. And I said, ah, no, it's a, no. And he said, he said, well, let's go, let's go drag the slip. And I'm sitting there thinking, I, I wouldn't let the kids get away with it. And he's wanting to do something. I said, shit, let's just, let's do two sets. Let's just do two sets of what we're supposed to. We had four sets that day. And um, so warmed up, I hated, every rep of the first set, then the second set, ah, not too bad. Then after I finished that second set, I said, damn, I can't bitch out halfway through this. And so he said, Jared, he's, he said, what are you thinking? I said, three. And so um, after you do, after we did our third set, it was, shit, we're here at four. And I, who in the hell is gonna leave here when they got one set left? So we did our, uh, ended up doing all four sets, but him talking me into doing it when I didn't want to because I was trying to get out of here. I told my wife I'd be home early and y'all know how that is. You tell, hey, look, I'll be home at four. Shit, I haven't finished squatting till four. So <laughs> it's okay because she, she's getting, she's been used to me being late home from the gym because, you know, just because the gym closes at three don't mean I leave here at three. Sometimes the gym closes at three and I've left here at five. Um, there's just sometimes I just got shit to do and I just want to stay here and do it take care of the gym like I'm supposed to and um, she knows that so she's pretty good about it and so and sometimes the doing it so ended up squatting and so then we put our regimen in now to where we get to the gym early on uh, Sundays because I squat Sundays and Wednesdays it's a lot easier for me and my athletes they squat Tuesday Thursday Sunday um, so that's how we got screwed up on that day because my bench days are Monday, Thursday, Thursday's a squat day here, so it's easy for me to bench on that Thursday. Um, so my most of my training is I bench twice a week, I squat twice a week. Um, if I can get to where I can recover now, I like to squat three days a week for a month, two days a week the next month, three days a week the next month, and try to bounce it off. If I try to push myself too fast, um, right now it just, the body says, no, I'm not, and, because I put my workouts off to the side for so long for, for the people coming here, I'm starting to just, you know, I had two people come last month and they were here every day. They said, hey, we'll be here. We got from now to till uh, January because we got to get ready for football because their football season canceled. It's so, okay, you're gonna be here. I'm gonna take my time with you and stuff. So, so they'd come in, oh, shit, I suppose this, when well, I needed to take, take care of them. So I'd end up training them instead of training myself and now they're not even here. It's like, damn it. So I need to start, and, and if people come here, or, or I'm gonna start working out and that way people can see me um, doing the stuff that I'm asking them to do. Um, just like the other day when I had some kids come in here, we were squatting and they watched me squat. And um, so I had them actually film me so that I could show other people so I don't have to squat every second of the time when I'm trying to show somebody how to do it. Um, I, I go down fairly slow, I sit, I do a good pause, boom, then I'm off the box as quick as I can, uh, watching Nintendo, trying to hit, look, this right here's gonna be a 7-3, so I'm trying to talk shit, trying to tell them I'm gonna hit these numbers, then I'm going in and I'm attacking those numbers. I'm just not casually freaking squatting. 
I am exhausted after every rep of every set. I am trying to put 100% max effort speed into the reps, whether that be a five, whether that be a 0.4, whether that be a 0.6 or a 0.7. If I got, um, uh, we had a lighter day the other day, I said my first, and I was just screwing around with a Tendo unit trying to call my numbers. My first three is gonna be a seven. My next um, two will be a six, and my last one will be another seven just to try to so I can gauge my speeds. Like uh, if I want to tell somebody, hey, I'm gonna jump a 25.3 inch vertical, I'm gonna go over there and jump a 25.3 inch vertical or be very close within that. I like to have great kinesthetic awareness and that, knowing where I am in, in space. Um, but the, the whole thing about the mental resistance is you gotta have training partners. Like that kid over there squatting 295 by himself in an empty gym, uh, freak, there's no motivation there. And, and if you watch these kids over here, the ones that miss reps is they don't have any driving force. I told someone the other day, you walk into a stadium at high school and you play in front of a soccer crowd. When you go to soccer games in high school, no one shows up. Versus you go out to the field at UGA where you got 90 something thousand people screaming. It's a different feeling, it's a different atmosphere. I said, the more people around me, the more fuel I have. Um, and Louis, and I was trying to find Louis's article years ago, talked about training partners. Training partners are the key. Like I have to have certain people lift me off when I bench. It's a bitch to spot me when I bench. You know, I've got safety side spots uh, when I bench. I just don't bench without, so if he, the weight I bench sometimes is the weight more than most people is gonna deadlift. So, and if something blows out, tears, stretches, strains, or whatever, I need to be able to get out from up under the bar, and if I can't press up because something's strained or whatever, my spotter ain't gonna be able to pull the damn thing off of me. So I, that's how I bench, and I need certain people lift it off because I like it handed off a certain way. I bench on the hardest bench. I think I went over that on the last podcast, so I'm not gonna go down that road. But uh, training partners, so like when these, I got these two young kids, uh, one of his friends from his football team started coming. When it, that friend foot from the football team started coming, that kid started pushing harder. If I want you to squat 500 and you don't want to squat 500 and you're capable of squatting 500, but you just don't feel like doing it, then you're not gonna do it. So you, if you've got the people around you, just like I was gonna give you an example, like the kid that was in the squat rack, he got three out of five reps. Well, I go over there and, and watch him with some other people. Next set, he got all five reps. And I said, see, you're getting strong enough to where you can't squat by yourself anymore. So as you become more seasoned, more advanced with your squatting in particular, get people to watch you. Hey, hey, come watch this set. I'll have um, even little kids come watch me squat. It holds you accountable. You want to try hard. You don't want to look bad. You need to be the example for the people that you're training with. And um, But sometimes when it's just me and my training partners, damn, I'm... I may try to get out of it too. I'm not perfect, you know? So they'll, hey Jerry, we gotta get this done. Hey, hey, are you gonna bench today or not? Hey, look, I'm leaving at this time. You need to bench. I'm like, okay. Uh, so that helps me. And the hard thing about me sometimes is, is, is I'll get out of regimen like to where I'm having to start over. Like, shit. Um, starting over and training, I'm not where I was several months ago. And I'm like, damn. So it, it's, it's harder for me to get the motivating factor, but, but having those training partners helps me and, and as I'm gaining some of my gains back to where I was a few months ago, I am now more motivated to stay on my consistent regimen because it's coming back and I don't want to go backwards again. Um, and sometimes I'll go backwards, I went backwards on my squat because I tore my adductor. So I'm taking a different approach to squatting this time. I'm trying to be, even if I'm not supposed, even if I'm supposed to squat a certain number of weight, that, a certain amount of weight that day and I don't do it, I, I'm telling myself and I'm telling these kids, some squatting is still better than no squatting. Um, the, um, the kids saw how I was thinking the other day is, I was in here benching and I after my last rep of my third set, I believe, I felt the strain in my chest. And so I'm, I'm motivated now to train since I've been doing it for a while. And so I was coming back and I said, I'm gonna do my last set. And I went and gathered some kids. Uh, I said, look, I need you to spot me. I need you to spot me. I got a spotter each side of the bench and I got the back spotter and also have my side rails on my bench to where 
if anything happens at the last second or drop of a hat, it, I'm protected. Um, years ago, I was scared to bench because uh, you just never know. So I lay up under that bar and um, so I got smart, got me some side rails, so now I don't care. Um, so I had this guy, because I told the people spotted me, I said, I think I felt something strained in my chest. It just tightened up pretty good. And um, so they were over there talking and the kid goes, you're still gonna bench? I said, yeah, I said, I'm just gonna see if I can get through it. And um, so I, I, I did it, I was able to get through it. Um, they actually didn't feel anything on the last set, but I'm taking an extra two days rest this week. So I'm, my bench schedule is gonna be screwed up. So I benched Monday, it's gonna be Saturday, then I gotta go bench Monday to get back on Monday and Thursday again. But stuff like that, I'm not scared, but it could happen. I've got heavier weight, more sets this time. So I'm giving it a little extra day, throw off my schedule a little bit um, so I can continue to get that stuff taken care of because I got to stay on top of it. People like to see me bench, you know, if you're, I got to get back, I was doing 315, four sets of nine with double chains on each side. So a lot of people can't do that. So I need to try to take care of that. Um, and some of these other questions, uh, I had a conversation with, um, Blake at Groundhouse uh, Strength Conditioning out in uh, Bakersfield, California. And uh, so some of these questions are actually gonna come from him. He asked if I had my athletes, uh, when they get to a 35, 36 inch vertically, if I have trouble improving them out of that range, if that's, if that's kind of our plateau level. No, our plateau level is usually 38, 39, getting to 40, then, then we're okay. But our plateau level is usually about 38, 39. And sometimes they're only there, if they're 38, 39, and they've been jumping with, without, like I just told you about, without people around. So if I had a kid, he jumps a 38.2 and and he's over there jumping by himself or maybe with like one, one other or two other people that no real competitive atmosphere is going on. Um, sometimes I'll film them, that's why you'll see these pictures of me posting these kids in the air. So I'll put a camera on them, I'll change the music, and I'll get more people, hey, y'all come watch this, he's about to jump 40. And they're looking around like, what? And I said, look, get these numbers in your head, and let's get after it. And um, I said, I said you can do it, let's roll. And so I said, y'all come watch. And uh, so they come over here, they come watch him, jumps to 41, he completely passed, I mean, 40, but 41, and so he's like, I said, yeah, that's why it's critical that you get people to watch you. If they can get 38, but if they're getting 38, 39 with all the people around them, it's still, they're not gonna be able to get that extra boost that day, but at least we're there. And sometimes when they hit a number like that guy jumping to 41, he may have bad jumps for the next um, two weeks before they come back up. Something happens at that point in time that I can't quite describe. Um, so like I had a kid, the highest he was jump, jumping was 36. So I bring people around, he jumped to like a 38, seven or something real high like that. And he was surprised too. But then he was been struggling with 35s and stuff in that range staying right there. I said, look, once you get to a 38, without me coming over or changing the atmosphere, then, then you're ready. So it, sometimes it can be the atmosphere for, for these jumps, um, but they should not stay at 35, 36 longer than um, if you're staying there longer than two months, something's up with the jump training. Uh, my guys don't stay at 38, 39, unless they quit coming or unless they drop off their frequency at the gym. Um, so the, we, we don't jump with ankle weights. We don't jump with weighted vests. We don't jump with kettlebells. We use uh, dumbbells and dump dumbbells only. We don't use different apparatuses. We don't do sit on a box, slam our feet, jump up with ankle weights or anything else like that. Years ago when I was trying to figure out how I was going to incorporate jump training into the programming, and for those of you who've never listened before, we jump, and our speed squats are our jumps. Our, our dynamic effort is our jumping, so we don't necessarily have a dynamic effort day. Um, so we have to work on a rate of force development. We also have to increase our strength and maximize our strength so that our rate of force development gets better. Um, 
Years ago, I was trying to jump train and I would jump with weighted vest on. Well, it changed my center of gravity too much. So I would go jump with a weighted vest. I'd come in, I was breaking my records, but when I took, and I went a couple of weeks where I just jumped with a weighted vest on, so I never left the ground outside of training or in training. I just always jumped with a weighted vest on. And one day I was showing somebody how to jump and and this was when we was jumping and hitting the slats on the vertex. I jumped up and I lost my equilibrium. I lost my balance in the air and I landed completely sideways on my ankle. And uh, I felt sick. I, uh, this was luckily when the gym was first opening because I only had like two people in there. So uh, one of the parents was there watching <laughs> We had to shut the gym down, roll the roll up doors down, get there, take me to the hospital, get my foot x-rayed. Um, it was pretty swollen and they said it didn't look cracked or didn't have a, a fracture, but they really couldn't tell they needed to come out just make sure one hairline fracture, uh, come back. And they said, um, they was trying to give me a boot and I told them I don't wear boots. Uh, they want to give me crutches and I don't like crutches. So I basically, hobbled out of there with no boot, no crutches. I don't like that crap. I do not like looking weak or like look, or look like I'm injured. I don't like looking any of that crap. If I had to have a knee brace on when I was training my MCLs in high school, I wore jeans over the knee brace and no one ever knew that I had a freaking knee brace on. Um, and I just don't like, I, I don't need attention and I don't want it. Um, and so then I, with the kettlebells, the way they swing in your hand, they're a little, they're a little different too. And so I don't like adding stuff directly to the body, like with your legs, because if you're jumping with ankle weights on and you're used to feeling your legs a certain way in the air, I don't want it to mess up. And with the jumping with the ankle weights on, if you're jumping high enough and you're landing with those damn ankle weights on, that shit hurts. So that could prohibit or limit somebody from trying maximum effort, because if the ankle weights are hurting their ankles, it, they may not want it bad enough, you know, to, to take that pain all the time. Um, but the thing about the weighted vest, even when I was trying to compare, when I was starting to figure out this jump training, the dumbbells, we were doing dumbbell jumps. We were jumping with dumbbells. We were jumping with weighted vest on, um, but we never did the weighted vest or ankle weights. We're not trying to be super armored jumpers here. Um, but once you do the heavy light method, you jump a weight, you jump a with weight, the next jump you jump without the weight, you still have your same feel. Uh, you don't lose your balance um, in the air. You still feel powerful. With the weighted vest on, when you went, when you went bent over to come back up, that's a different feel. And it was a lot harder to change the vest on people and produce a constant uh, vertical jump improvement result because it did not always change all the time but my weighted vests were 20 pounds and 40 pounds well shit sometimes we jump with dumbbell jumps with 40s in each hand so that 40 pound weighted vest if I had 20s in each hand my guys usually are 25 or 30 is what we start with uh, the girls can be as low as 8s or 12s I do have kilogram weights so I can mess around with that but those I don't and I don't think the weighted vests were actually heavy enough to produce the results as the heavier dumbbells were doing. Um, so that's why another reason I don't like the weighted vest on. We did put 60 pounds on, but by the time you went down and bent over with it all up top, your center of gravity was just so far off that it was really hard to gather yourself to produce uh, the results that you were actually looking for. So I don't have people jumping but we stay with dumbbells we wave different weights we jot them down we come back we try to break those records to uh, improve most of our stuff all right Blake also asked how do I handle the younger kids like squat maxing regular squat do I max do, do I do max effort stuff with them uh, when the, a younger kid first comes to the gym I make sure they I, I teach them how to squat and they regular squat most of my young kids if they are 12 and under they're gonna start off on a regular squat because if you start them off on the box, they just kind of tend to plop down to the box. They don't learn any type of control. So I call a regular squat here, your base. You gotta, you gotta build your base so that when they learn how to squat, 
Um, and, and the younger kids are also shorter. So the, the, my boxes are all taped at 12 inches. So even for my 6'2 people, if they're 6'3 or higher, I may give them a, a one inch pad, maybe an inch and a half pad to where they can put up under the blue pad to raise it up a little bit for them. But I'll see people next door, they'll have that thing jacked up four or five holes. I'm like, geez, these people, these people are squatting and training up here based off of this is how I feel and this is instead of what I need to do. You know, these people with all these freaking feelings out there, oof. You, you don't base stuff off of your feelings, you base stuff off of what produces a result. And what produces results some, sometimes does not feel good. And um, anyway, before I get off on that, the how do I handle these young kids? They'll come in, they do squat max. I do have nine year old girls, I do have 10 year old boys. They will do a squat max, it will not hurt them. And, and, and a lot of this stuff out there, these kid training, oh, I'm oh, I'm growth play. And I still get these questions sometimes, am I gonna stunt their growth? Hell no. If you look at the kids, um, I don't know where the research is, but kids that lift with it before puberty, sometimes they actually, and it was measured in centimeters, they may be uh, two to three centimeters higher. And so it could actually potentiate growth, but it's not definitely not gonna stunt it. Um, the national strength conditioning, even as young as six years old, six year old kids. And the national strength conditioning book also says it's even safe to max them, even as young as six. So I don't know, I, I may have an article like that on my website, explosivemechanics.com. Uh, young kids training, or just type in explosive mechanics youth training on Google and it should pop up and you kind of read an article that I wrote on that. Um, but I was telling, I was probably telling Blake this, the Kids are kids are different, you know. They sometimes I, I I'll squat kids three days a week. How I many often you squat a kid? Not once a week. If my collegiate athletes squat three days a week, my high school athletes, my middle school athletes, my youth athletes, yeah, three days a week. Um, the even the nine year olds, yeah, we're gonna squat and we're gonna push. We may even do hard sets of five, um, and we'll do that two or three days a week. Kids, I, I was telling Blake, they recover. And there's the kids are like people in the 30s on steroids. Their ability, steroids help these people recover and they're able to get these strength gains, adapt, and, and move on from point A to point B a lot quicker. The hormones and the nervous system in a kid is so, it's not hardwired in yet. It, it's, it's so adaptive and their ability to recover is so freaking high that they can handle it. Just like if I went out to football practice after I was in high school or even in college, we get off the field, when you're done with practice, you're taking your ass home. You take your little kids, after practice, you turn around, they're out there playing football with each other after practice. I mean, kids are just, kids are just different. There's not, and, and I think that the hard thing is and it, that makes it out there is you know, Louis said, uh, Michael Fahey down here to interview me for the uh, West Side versus the World movie. Uh, so Michael Fahey at West Side Film, check him out. The, what am I doing with these kids? I'm just training kids and these kids, they recover and their adaptation rate is so great at that young age, they can handle a lot more. You know, these people are like, oh, I don't wear them out. Oh, I don't want to wear them out. Oh, I don't want them to do too much. Well, you don't know what too much is until you know what too much is, how far too much is. So it, like what I do here is I test these athletes at the end of each month and we're, we're, te we're tracking our vertical jump, we're tracking our broad jump, we're tracking our 10 yard dash, our 40 yard dash, and our 20 yard dash. We're getting all these. So if the kids go into wrestling practice, if they got football and they're coming here and they're having school and they're improving, that's not too much because their kids are able to handle it. Now, a college kid or someone that's a little bit more advanced that knows how to tap into their system a lot more, it may be a little bit harder on them, but you never assume or never take for granted, uh, oh, that's too much. Well, that your thought process on what too much may be just right. What's too much is you thinking too damn much. And so, the kid's ability to be able to recover, the only way you're gonna know what too much is, is if you test and you monitor and you, and you just take care of the training process. Um, 
even the kids that are tired, even the kids, like I had a kid that had not been here in, in three weeks for some unknown reason, and guess what? I put on their, um, for, for their, their SWAT that day, what they were supposed to do the next time they came back that next day, three weeks ago, to see what had what, what happened and handle at that day. Did I back out? No, hey, look, let's just see what happens. This whole training and strength conditioning thing is an experiment. You know, you gotta retest research, you know? I'm glad I didn't wait out for some of the research to come out, but sometimes you, you hear what the research says, well, shit, why don't you just take it to the gym and don't, and retest it yourself on your athletes to see if, if sometimes that stuff works. You know, like the heavy light method with dumbbell jumps. Load release, you can't do, load release, I don't like load release with the dumbbell jumps, but sometimes you just have to, um, you just have to test it out. And a lot of this research stuff's not been done on youth, youth athletes. So I deal with a lot of youth athletes. I, I'm a semi-private or a private gym to where people off the street can't come in here and work out. Um, no walk-ins, none of that. Like I said, if I'm not here, the place is shut down. And the thing about the young kids is, sometimes the parents, if the vertical jump's going up, and sometimes the, the, the young kids like that, their 40 yard dashes, if they're here frequently enough, they will still knock off a tenth of a second off of a 40 yard dash per month. But if they, I should have brought some folders over here so I can go over that a little bit more in detail, but sometimes they will actually, if they skip a month, they may lose two tenths of a second. Then they come back next month, then it looks like they never, then they will start to get better again. But if you don't have a month to month to month to month record of how fast they ran the 40 at the end of that each month, and if so if you just tested month one, you didn't test again to month four, well, they missed month three, month four may, shows very slight improvements since month one. So that's a way of tracking stuff to where if you can see month one, month two, three, four, and five, and you know their consistency, you will see whether the training's working or not, and not don't wait so many six weeks, eight weeks to test, and if the kid's not frequently, coming frequently, they will see that. Say so I had a kid last year, came started coming in January, coming once a week. Well, she had the first two months, his 40 stayed the same. And uh, he would, you know, they'll say, oh, this don't work. Well, look, you need to start coming more often. And so he was running like a 6'1", 6 flat 40. And so the next month he came twice a week. Ooh, 40 went down 10. Next month, twice a week, 40 went down 10. Next week, next month, um, started coming three days a week. What I'm trying to say is within 11 months, we went from running a six flat, six one, to a four eight 40 yard dash because after about five or six months, he started coming every day. And seeing the speed, I need to get this. Now he's um, entering his freshman year of high school running a 4840 on complete laser system. Smoking fast, and if you think a 4840 is fast, you don't know what fast is until you run on a laser system. Uh, laser start, laser finish, laser everything, I don't even touch anything. And so he learned the importance of frequency just because I tested each month, he could see the in numbers improving each month. Now the work to improve those numbers was not always fun, but he did it. Um, so again, training kids not in books, you gotta sometimes do your own stuff. And, uh, and I also told this is that frequency with kids is big time, all right? So how do I handle this? If, if the kid does, if they come twice a week, I may volumize their workouts, which means I may squat them four sets of eight, or four sets of six or something around that range or maybe four sets of nine or 10. Or I may even do like, um, I had an Olympic coach, I may even do like a run of 10-8. Um, so if, if he, these are, I'm talking more about the youth athletes, um, 12 and under. Uh, we may go 10 reps, eight, six, four, and two, but for them, I jump up 10 pounds. So 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, something like that. We're gonna go up because um, Usually with a 5% method or 5%, if the kids around 100 pound squat, go up five pounds, but I'm actually going up 10. So you can go up 67, 80, 90, 100. You can go up a little bit greater than 5% on their squat and drop down two reps. So if you wanted to start them off at 50 for 10, 60 for eight, 70 for um, 
six, 80 for four and 90 for two. Next one, next time, if they did the 90 for two, next time you go, instead of starting off at 50, you go 67, 80, 90, 100, or wherever you want to take it from there. But I do, and I don't really do that often, uh, that rep scheme. It's only, I will do that if the younger, like especially the, the young girls, I told somebody the other day, uh, kids are like training older females. Uh, they're gonna respond a lot more to volume and they're gonna respond a, a lot better to volume if they're coming less frequently. But now the more frequently they come, the higher their intensity is, the higher the, uh, the weight is and the, um, the reps drop. We may go down to fives or threes. So if I got a kid coming three days a week, he's gonna, the boy or girl is gonna respond really well to fives and threes. But if they're only coming twice a week, maybe once this week, twice the next week, I'm gonna have to increase the volume on them. So, and if I do that, they tend to do a lot better. So anyway, I hope that helps people out there. And if you got questions, like you can do like these people that I'm about to go over, um, just send me questions through IG. I'm gonna start paying a lot more attention to that so that I can try to answer these questions uh, and give us more podcast material to talk about. So uh, this first question comes from Maine Athletic Performance. Um, what do you guys use to assess adaptation rate? Um, we don't have a tool or anything that we use to assess, assess the adaptation rate. It's just that if the kids come in, they're the same strength. And over time, I've been here 12 years dealing with kids six, seven days a week for that number of time. I could tell by sets and reps and whatever schemes that I'm putting them on that this kid's adapting to this at a rate better than this other kid. Like I had this kid that's not been here in a while. He was 20 pounds behind this kid that hadn't been coming frequently. And so, I mean, I'm talking eighth graders. Um, and now the kid that just started coming has now gained 20 pounds over the other kid. So that one kid that's gaining faster is that adapting to the training stimulus a lot better. And they're both coming at the same time. Uh, they're the example I gave earlier of the two kids that push each other. Um, so they come the same, same amount of frequency every day and they push each other. One's just responding to the stimulus a little bit better than the other. Um, so, and that could be based off what they're doing outside the gym, how they're eating or, or whatever. And you usually don't see eating affect performance of younger youth athletes as much as you do the older ones. So, and sometimes that stuff is BS, but anyway, so we don't really have stuff. It's just my eye knowing all these athletes that come in here. I don't have trainers, so I can't, I have direct contact with them to where I can see, I know, and um, I think that's the biggest key is I don't rely on someone else to tell me something. I need to see it myself. So, um, main athletic performance, I hope that helps. Um, the, this next question comes from the real big K7. Do I feel that box squats with a foam pad produce greater vertical jump results than free back squats? Yeah. Uh, do I free back squat my athletes at all? Yes. Um, like I said earlier, uh, the real big K7 is that some of my athletes are regular squatting with a straight bar. Some of them are box squatting with a straight bar. Some of them are doing Paul squats, no box with a straight bar. Some of the people are in the same thing. I, I treat them the same way on the safety squat bar. Some people are safety have the safety squat bar, box squat, safety bar, box squat, regular squat, safety bar, pause squat. So I change stuff up, and I don't know if I talked about this before, but to change your squat, you gotta change your squat. You just don't stay sitting on the same box squat with the same bar all year long. You may go two months with a, uh, with more of your high school kids, some of the young kids, the uh, you can get a running result from them, but I just don't like the young kids plopping on the box. The young kids, if I move them to regular squat, their 40 yard dashes don't change. So I'm, I'm doing this to a kid I've done several times to, he just, he, he's always here. And so he was frustrated because his 40 yard dash was not where he wanted it to be. Well, I took him off the box because he wasn't squatting on the box the way I wanted to. But although he was doing a piss poor box squat, was not perfect, you know, and I hate these people saying being perfect all the time, was not the greatest, but sometimes I just want to get the weight up. Well, I put this kid on the box 
his Ford Empress. I take him off the box, and last month he was frustrated because his running speed was not doing right. I said, well, look, we're gonna do this month. We're gonna put you back on the box squat, uh, but now we're gonna tender you with it and need you to chase those numbers. Um, and so he needed to build greater structure. His regular squat got really good, um, but that's gonna build. Sometimes I don't care, that kid comes so often, I don't care if he improves month for month. For, I, I'm looking at the bigger future down the road where it's really gonna matter. These bits and pieces here do matter to some people sometimes, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build this athlete and, and, and athlete building is takes years years and years to improve and with with young kids you need to take care of them that 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 kid should be an example of what I am capable of as a strength conditioning specialist um, he should be an example of the gym when he gets older a kids not gonna be an example as a kid they can show right technique and do stuff like that but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying very consistent, comes here all the time, so I don't have to worry about proving something. If he's here and he's been here, I don't have to worry about proving something to his mom or his dad because they trust me, they're bringing him here. So I'm gonna take time and I'm gonna invest and I may not care if he improves every month because I have to build his record squat so that when we go back to box squat, his box squat gets better. Sometimes they're sloppy box squats, they'll still get running speed improvements, running speed improvement, running speed improvements. But sometimes I can only go too far let them get away with something that's too bad. And so then I'll put them on a um, straight bar, regular squat, build their great foundation with a straight bar. And then as time goes on, kid got frustrated. So look, hey, look, let's go back to box squat. But now I've got more interest in him so I'm investing in him because now he's creating and talking to me we're creating more conversations and and trying to figure this stuff out so now he's gonna be a person that's gonna be able to go out in the real world and know um, do I feel that box squats with a foam pad produce greater vertical jump results yes we use a softer foam pad we don't elite fitness sells a blue pad and they sell a black pad they're both six inches thick but the soft surface of a box squat, when you're doing it with the blue pad, it creates and produces more leg drive. Well, you need more leg drive to get off the mat at a higher rate of force. Um, a hard box, if you did just a regular box with a hard pad or put a plate on it or just did a regular box squat with a blue or with the black pad, it's a stiffer surface to where you don't sink into it. That's gonna work more your hips and your hamstrings. Well, what do you need for vertical jump? You need leg drive. What do you need for um, getting out of your stance and before you need leg drive you need hips and hamstrings 20 pass but there's other exercises in the gym that i can do to build hips and hamstrings um that's just as effective as doing a hard box squat so i'm going to produce the greatest results with a soft blue pad when i squat and create more leg drive with a pad and and how i do this is that everybody comes in here they usually jump every so if you're coming here three days a week and you're not coming consecutive three days, you'll probably jump three days that week. If you're coming twice a week, you're definitely jumping twice a week. And so over time, I'm monitoring their numbers and seeing what happens with these athletes as I'm able to, being that I do have them also did, doing various different styles of squats, we're not all just one concrete, ooh, they, that's all I do is box squat. No, we, we squat based on what you need in order to help you perform better at your 40 yard dash and at your vertical jump. So that's how I've been able to assess most of that um, and like I said earlier I think is that my safety squat bar right now they squat box squat with a blue foam pad to where they sink into it and those guys are popping up I had a guy go from 30 to 36 inch vertical in four weeks um, and so I should have brought his folder and there's another guy I had a guy who came in here jumping a 32 inch vertical and he's already at uh, 42 inches in four four months or something like that. So it's, yes, I feel just because I've seen it a thousand times versus other bars and stuff, some of these people don't um, improve their jumps as much with just a regular squat. And I think it's because the box squat breaks up the eccentric concentric chain, causing greater neural drive after you break up the eccentric concentric chain to produce that greater rate of force development. So uh, this next question comes from uh, Drew DG23. If I could, uh, 
if I could lead him in the direction of a podcast or episode of a podcast to explain a sample for a workout at the gym. Um, so yeah, I actually brought some. I actually brought what we did for the people. Ten fifteen. Uh, that was Thursday, so that was a mainly a squat day. So if you're coming every day, you're gonna squat uh, on Thursday, like I said, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday for my everyday people. So first thing on the list, box squat. Then after box squat, we went to our dumbbell jumps, which is A, B, so we do a weighted jump, then a non-weighted jump, rest, non-weighted, I meant weighted, then non-weighted. And we have a sticker right here where I write the weight of the dumbbell that they're gonna jump with, and I'm looking back through their folder. So all right now, if you gotta jump a, with the, um, so if you got a kid with the 30s, you got to jump a 28.5 with that to beat what you did last time. And sometimes I'm more concerned about the weighted jump versus the non-weighted vertical jump. Sometimes when these athletes are jumping with the 30s, their vertical jump without the weight on that day, non-weighted is generally not good. Um, and may, they may jump a 30 with the 30s, but jump a 33 or 34 without them. Uh, but then you switch them to where they're jumping with heavier dumbbells, so they're gonna have a much larger Thing and it's actually when they jump with the heavier dumbbells, they're without weighted jump that day actually improves a lot. And so sometimes that's how we're getting those higher numbers. So anyway, we went from squat to our dumbbell jumps. Then we did walking lunges, uh, three sets of 30 yards each. Then we after that we went to back extensions, uh, which is which is just regular hypers hanging over and coming out straight. We supersetted that with GHRs to go down, pre fatigue the uh, low back and hamstrings by doing the back extensions. Then we pop off 10 glute ham raises to finish that. Then at the end of that workout, we did cable abs. For the people that are not coming every day, we benched, then we did incline, then we went to box squat, then we did our dumbbell jumps after our box squat. Then we went back and did some more upper body work with lat pull downs and tricep press downs. And then we worked on our springs by doing uh, hurdle, sets of hurdle jumps. So that's two examples of actually what we did on Thursday. So that's how I can separate, that's how we could bench and squat and dumbbell jump in the same day, but we're missing a lot more accessories. But like you've heard me on the years before, for a long time, all I did was bench press, tricep press down, my bench went up out the water. I, I took a 365 incline to 405 incline without ever, uh, with, with just bench, just inclining and doing tricep press downs, that's it. Um, so, Sometimes these young kids, and it's bad once they know they can get away. You know, I've, I've said on other podcasts before, minimum effective dosage. What is the minimum, that way, the, the, the minimum effective dosage. What can I, minimally can I do to get away with it in order to continue getting better? That's less I have to, if I can get away with less stuff, that's less I have to recover from. That's how I can be more frequently or do stuff more frequently. So, you know, that's why they squatted, they jumped and they did some hurdle jumps at the end. Um, so not a whole lot of lower body stuff after that. Sometimes I make them do leg curls. Um, uh, sometimes they, they do, it just depends on what's going on. Um, but so that you see, we mainly bench, we squat and we jumped and we threw some lats and try to have some more hurdle jumps. Um, and sometimes these kids, I'll let them stay longer if they want to get some more hamstring work. Um, but that's that. So what, uh, so this next question comes from Pivotal Sports Performance. What device do we use to test our vertical jumps? Well, we use a, when we train on the jump mat, it gives us a direct, better feedback. The National Strength Conditioning Association correlated the, or said they did Vertimax, I mean, not Vertimax, Vertec with the slats like you see at the NFL combine, they did that versus the jump mat. And the athletes were coming out with the same numbers on the mat as they did uh, the Vertec. Well, I could have told you that uh, 2015 when I was training um, Lasky for get ready for the uh, NFL, he jumped a 35.1 on the mat. Well, at his Georgia Tech Pro Day where they tested him on the Vertec, guess what, he jumped a 35. Um, the Vertec is just 35, 35 and a half, 36, they go up by halves. But the, the thing about the jump mat is if you can see that I, I jumped a 29.9, when you jump a 29.8, uh, nine on the Vertec, you actually just jump a 29 and a half. You're not even that close to 30. So you don't know exactly where you are. Ooh, 29.9. If I push a little harder, if I, I got that much more effort, I, a little bit more and I can get it just a little bit harder. I could push just a little bit harder to get this. 
Um, but sometimes with the Vertec, you don't get that thought process because you're more worried about, oh, was I close? How close was I? You know, you're now you got, you're second guessing yourself. You don't know. But with the, the mat, you do know um, if I try a little harder, I can get that 30. With the Vertec, it's not so much. Um, and a couple, then I had another guy, he was a three, he was a six two, 300 pound lineman and jumped a 30 inch, uh, 34 inch vertical on the mat. Well, guess what? When he goes to his pro day, he got tested, he jumped a 34. So I've already had two athletes um, that were hitting the same numbers. And sometimes people are skeptical about jumping on the jump mat. Um, but you know, if you learn how to cheat a jump mat or whatever you want to call it, once you cheat, you can only cheat a cheat so much in order to cheat, cheat you're gonna have to get better at cheating. There's only so much cheating you do to get better at so It will continue to rise your jump just because you got a direct feedback look at it and had hard concrete numbers. Uh, so we test our athletes per month on the jump mat, but if we are getting ready for the NFL combine, we do jump mat and we do uh, get them familiar with the vertex so that they feel comfortable doing it. So sometimes results are based on if you're comfortable with that, what you're doing or not. Um, so that hopefully we use primarily the jump mats, uh, but I do have the vertex just and the only people that do the Vertec are the people getting ready for the NFL. So, um, or I may have some volleyball players that need to have a video vertical approach for their uh, volleyball stuff. So this one comes from Keon 2480. I was wondering if I had any tips for um, increasing the bench press. This is one of my weakest lifts that I struggle with. I think it has to do with my tricep strength, but I'm not sure. Also, do you have any programs for increasing explosiveness and strength. Um, I don't do any online programming and I don't have any programs for sale. Uh, just because I like hands-on, I'm a coach, it's not, I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't have products just to sit out there and go show and sell. Um, I have toyed with the idea, but I do remote train some of the athletes that have been here. Um, like a girl, girl that goes, I think she's about 200 miles away from here. Um, I got another girl that goes to another state over. So, but they've been here, but when they're not here, you can talk to them. They don't improve at the rate there as they would if they were here with me all the time like they were when they were in high school. So that's why I remotely train them. I usually only remotely train people that have already been to the gym because I know them and I can get to their issues faster because I know where they've struggled at before. So, um, increasing the bench press, increasing the bench press. And um, um, the biggest thing you could do is do a tricep press down max. You gotta figure out how strong your triceps are. When my tricep press down, my max was 130 on press downs. I had to do a strict press down. I pull it down to my chest, just, um, I mean, Jackie, because I say I'm gonna do these videos and I don't do these videos. I need to show people how to do tricep press downs. Um, I pull it down to my chest, I pause, stop it there, then I continue just to press it out. And I keep my wrist cocked up because that's how my wrist are when I bench press and you fill it up higher on your tricep. And so once I took my tricep press down from doing 130 to doing 150 for reps, my incline went from 365 to 405 within a six week period. So, I mean, that's a high bench. If you bench 365 on incline, you can bench. If you bench four or five on incline, you can really bench. And the only thing that I really did at that point in time was I pushed the shit out of my tricep strength to make sure my tricep strength went up, and I did. and went from 134 max to doing 115s per set to five. Uh, so, the biggest thing is, like you said, you, you gotta increase your bench. Number one, you need to make sure you're arching. If, if the better your bench press technique is, the better you're, the better you arch, the better you press. Uh, but your limiting factor is continually improve. Your bench press will be your triceps. Although I know that sometimes I like uh, I have not skipped my tri I work my I bench on Mondays, Thursdays, but I work my triceps Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. Um, because if I do back off my tricep training, my bench does get harder and it does not improve. Um, and it even going backwards by skip. I even went through a phase where I, I skipped triceps for, for a long time and my bench started going backwards. Although my bench was consistent, it started suffering. So once I started adding triceps and bench sets and reps got a lot easier. So that's the biggest key. And um, 
this, uh, this guy, this question comes from Davis Weaver. Have I ever thought about making an online training program? Yeah, but I, I don't know if I'm ever, I, I gotta take care of the people here. Like I said, I don't have, I don't have people helping, I don't have employees. I don't have, I don't have the manpower to do it. Um, and sometimes I've got, I have even had 30 athletes in the gym at one time. I'm not dealing with two or three athletes all the time. Um, I think average would be about 14, 15 kids per hour. Um, so sometimes it could really be busy and I'm here in the afternoons, but with this COVID shit going on, I'm, I'm here in the mornings too. So I've got some, some school systems are out uh, doing half weeks. So some of those kids are coming in the morning. So now I'm here a lot more. That's why these podcasts have not been coming out as frequently, but I am pretty busy. Um, I do have personal life as well. And so it, it, I just don't want the online training to distract with people that come here um, all the time. And uh, I don't want, just don't want to be bogged down and drained with it. So um, I have thought about it. I don't know if I'll ever do it, um, but I would like a way to reach more people and help them out there so if i can think of a way to do that and i don't know if that's maybe doing sample workouts online paying online subscription or something like that uh, but as far as directly coaching it does take a lot of time to help remote athletes and um i don't know so this next one comes from jsal67 um did i have trouble getting the younger athletes to have the bar on their back comfortably while squatting, I usually use a pad for my younger guys, wondering how you get past that stage and if you ever go through that stage. Um, yes, we do. We, I start at, at my young kids, if they're eight or nine years old, I make sure they can squat down properly. Once they do that, I have a 20 pound kid bar. I got from, I think Rogue or something. They can squat that. If they can move that good, I like to get them to the 45 pound bar as quickly as possible. And uh, I even had nine year old little girls ask to grab squat with 95 pounds. Um, they are uncomfortable with the bar on their back, but being I, I do have some hidden somewhere, but most people don't even know that they exist. Um, like I had a nine year old girl, I never knew you had that, but she's also squatting uh, 115 for reps. <laughs> uh without without the pad but uh, most of the kids just like i talked about last on that last episode of the powerlifters uh, most of the kids i don't have belts for them you know we don't squat with belts we increase that uh structural strength and so what i what i see is most of these people coming in that have been have had power training experience they want to wear these damn knee sleeves wrist straps belt and they want to do different styles of squat. we don't do low bar squatting here um and this i was talking to one of the powerlifters and uh, I said, you need to quit that low bar squat. It's put too much damn strain on your wrist and your elbows and you're just making your bench suffer. And the kid goes, what's low bar squat? So a lot of the time that I don't even let the kids know why I even have a pad. I like to try to see it and I'll tell the kid, look, it's gonna hurt right here. And after about two weeks, it quit hurting. Um, but like I said, I've got, if I got 12 kids in here and that one kid's faced with, hey, do you want a pad? And he's, he or she's looking around, most time you'll get the head nod no because uh, they don't want to be that person. So I, yeah, I do experience it, but if I had to train someone one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I think squatting, um, you may have to have that depending on the, the number of people you have. Um, but usually I, I'll let them know it's not going to feel good, but it, if, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So the quicker I can get them loaded heavier, I found that the quicker I get them to start adding more weight to the bar, the quicker they get through that stage of hurting. And it generally only takes about a week or two. So either the first day, the second time, the third time, about the fifth time, they're they're okay. So I think by warning them, hey, look, it will get better. But if if you if you don't get if you don't do it, you're never gonna get used to it. I mean, you got some high school kids with a bar hurts their back, but then you got a high school kid that comes in here and never worked out before, and he sees a little kid over there squatting with, and, and they're good examples. Hey, look, you don't have a pad. And they're like, you still want a pad? And they're like, no. They, they'll end up toughing through it and they'll get through it much quicker. So I guess it really helps me when I've got so many people in here at, at one time that 
they uh, they see that yeah it's okay so anyway Jason I hope that helps you um, but I do try to get them on the bar as quickly as possible um, some kids can come out and just bang it out right away um, some kids squat forms are horrible so you gotta put squat wedges and they really help out a lot if you do like a bob squat from Westside barbell or get some uh, prime squat wedges and um, put those up under the heel um, just make sure they squat low and they try to apply some type of force or acceleration to the bar. Stand up with it quickly. Um, so anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, thank you all for the questions. I, if you have any other questions, email me info at Explosive Mechanics or you can just message me on Instagram at Explosive Mechanics. Um, but uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, have a good day.